Good afternoon, and welcome to the Edgewater Health Mind, Body, and Spirit Wellness Program. I am Latanya Woodson, the Director of Community Health Education right here at Edgewater Health. I can't believe we're into our ninth month of the wellness program. Wow. The year has went by so quickly, and I have been receiving so many testimonies about how not only the Mind, Body, and Spirit Wellness Program, but all of our programs here at Edgewater, how they are changing lives and empowering people to take charge of their health. This afternoon's presentation is no different, so we're going to dive right in to today's discussion as we will be addressing, advocating for the voiceless. So what does advocating for the voiceless look like? There is always an opportunity to speak on the behalf of individuals who may not have the ability to speak for themselves. It is a voice for those who have been silenced, ignored, or maybe someone experiencing language barriers that adversely impact their health care. Our featured speaker for this afternoon will answer those questions and so much more. But first, allow me a moment to introduce her. Miss Eve Gomez came to the United States as a young girl eager to learn much about a strange country. She adapted quickly to the American culture to learn the English language. As a teenager, she began to help her parents and siblings with interpretation due to their language barrier. She began to serve as an advocate for the Latino community and involved with various nonprofit organizations. Ms. Gomez has been recognized for many awards, including the Trailblazer Award, the National Hookup of Black Women Incorporated, the Community Service Award presented by the Wild Fest of East Chicago, among many others. She has been a radio personality for over 10 years, using that platform to speak on the behalf of the voiceless. She is the editor-in-chief of e Lifestyle Magazine. I hope I got that right. And firmly believes it is important to empower people who feel powerless. Won't you please help me welcome to the podium, Ms. E. Gordon. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope that you are here willing to learn but to also not just learn what I am experiencing, what I've shared, but about you. Many times we don't know that there's a leader in us and an advocate waiting to come out of you. Let's give a round of applause once again for Ms. Latina Woodson. She and I have partnered in several um, projects in the community, so that's how we come to know each other. And in case you guys don't know, I am a GI girl. <laughs> I represent, and I'm hoping that I represent well because I have a lot on my shoulders because I represent Christ first. And uh, I grew up in this beautiful city. We may not see the building so nice, but the beautiful thing that's happening is us, the people. The beautiful spirits that still walk on these streets as I too walk on these streets. Fifth and Maryland, right there. That home still exists, so I'm blessed to still be able to see that home as my family uh, used to all live there. And one of eight kids. My name is Eve. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this mic off. You know my I don't like to sit or stand like a freeze in silence. That's not my time. <laughs> oh speakers what we do we move around right and I'm a speaker that's what I like doing. I hope you guys don't mind okay you can hear me better right mm -hmm. although I can project and not need the mic but I think for uh, video purposes, I'm going to do that. So I grew up here in Gary, Indiana. I'm one of eight kids, second to the youngest. My name is Eve, and I am a twin. Some of you may know I have a twin, but what do you think his name is? It's Adam. 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 <laughs> that's right. Adam and Eve, that's right. Uh, obviously, he was born first so that we could be named Adam and Eve. My mom thought back in Mexico, to ask the priest, can she name us Adam and Eve? So his question was, well, who was born first? Well, my boy did. Okay, so Adam and Eve grows up, grows up. And I, actually, when I say rose up, 
We came from a country that we didn't know anything about this country. 1975, the currency, the culture, the language was all strange to us. But me, knowing that little eager girl, I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn. So I went to Spalding. Anybody know Spalding on that trip? Okay. Um, I still remember some of those teachers from there. So I had to learn rather quickly. I had an American Caucasian teacher for kindergarten. She didn't speak English. I mean, Spanish. I didn't speak English. Imagine that. Sign language. She was not a very nice, kind lady either, okay? <laughs> So I said, let me get out of kindergarten. I am seven years young. That's kind of embarrassing, right? Well, I started picking up the language within three or four months. They moved me to first grade, yay. I didn't want to stick around in that class, no offense to the teacher, but I learned so much from my friends that I still have now, thanks to social media, we can still connect with those friends. Growing up uh, with a family that the oldest had language barriers, was not a burden to me, but I felt like it was a responsibility to me. I am 12 years young going to the doctor's office with my oldest sister. She's 14 years older than I. I am filling out paperwork. I am speaking for them. What do I know about bodies and doctors at that age, right? But we learn fast, so as a person that goes into schools to talk to the youth, I always ask who speaks the second language and who interprets for their parents. And so I give them a sense of peace when I ask that question because I can relate to that. I don't want them to feel embarrassed or ashamed that they're doing that, because it can be. So they feel good once I tell them my story. That has allowed me to learn so much by doing it for my family. Because not everybody knows, even English speaking people, know their rights, know their do's and don'ts, as in, not just an advocate, but as an activist. I was one of those activists that marched, that had signs up, that protested in front of police stations. I was one of those. Why did I do that? Because I felt the sense of racial profiling. I felt the sense of discrimination. Hey, my own people discriminate each other. The darker gets the dark room and the lighter gets the light. I don't understand that, but it happens in families and I'm sure you all can relate to that, right? Well, I am very light complected that I was confused for, and excuse the derogatory word I'm going to use, no offense to anybody that's watching me live here on social media, but I didn't know what that was, and the word was honky. That's what I used to be called growing up by my African-American black friends and family in, in the community. I used to say, I'm not that, whatever that is, I'm not, I'm Mexican, I can't repeat, I'm Mexican. I'm gonna tell you, I'm still Mexican, but I'm also American, because United States Mexicans, that's downstate, that's down, down south of the border. Estados Unidos Mexicanos, that is the actual name for Mexico, because it's still United States, but it has to be Mexican, right? So uh, my roots are strong. I may not know much about my country, but I, I keep it in me, and whatever I can learn here from my country is the best that I can do. So, <laughs> Moving forward, I'm in high school. I'm still advocating for my parents, for my oldest brother, my oldest sister, answering the calls for them, my sister not knowing how to really express herself. So I was actually interpreting for family. Then I got involved in the community with not-for-profit organizations. I became a louder voice. God said, you be bold, and I think I've been bold since I was a kid, because I didn't have a shy bone in my body. I wanted to express my thoughts, express my feelings, and I can't, why not? I didn't like being censored. Being on the radio, sometimes people want to censor you. No, you can't. Um, and I say that humbly, not because I think I'm all that, God thinks I am all that, so I don't take credit for that. It's because it's to learn, but also what I learn to share with you all. Let me ask you one question. How many of you know, and you probably know, if you don't, guess at it, is the richest place on earth? Anybody? The richest place on earth, anyone? I learned this from Bernice A. King, Martin Luther King's daughter. They came here to Gary. We broke bread together. She spoke, I think it was at Ebenezer Church or something like that. 
and it stuck with me, and I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. Any guess? No, anyone else? No, anyone else? Oh, I'm getting a lot of chills just thinking about that. It's the cemetery. I said, I will die empty. I will empty myself every single day that if I learn something, you better believe you're gonna know about it because it's not for me to keep. And since I was a kid, whatever I knew, it wasn't for me to keep because there's a lot of inventions, a lot of books, a lot of businesses that went and got buried because they decided not to share it with anybody. So I hope that if you don't take anything of what I just said, take that with you and share it with your loved ones. I will die empty. For those that know me personally, know that I empty out every single day. So the two minutes, okay, is that all you want me to get out of me? Okay, that's it. It's 11, 12 o'clock at night. That's it, good night, world. Why do I do that? Because I saw what happens with my own family. Not knowing the language, not knowing their rights, not knowing, period. Being in the dark. We're in America, speak English, I've been told. Well, I spoke at a civil rights uh, symposium down in South Bend last year, and that was what I was talking about. Are you speaking my language? Let me just tell you, English isn't the language of America, in case you didn't know. We don't have an official language. We don't. It's not even in the Constitution. They tried, but it didn't happen. So we can speak whatever languages we choose to. And I hope that you guys start learning the language, whatever it is, and the most spoken language here is Spanish. And that's a passion of mine, is to whatever I know, I go from one language to the other. For those of you that heard me on the radio, I do it very, very efficiently and effectively because it's like second nature. I've been doing this since I was a kid, from English to Spanish, Spanish to English. I'm a professional interpreter in the medical field, in the legal field, in the educational field. As a matter of fact, I want to thank Edge Water System and Dominic Hughes for allowing me to be their uh, translator, voiceover. So if you ever call this number from Edgewaters, you wonder whose voice you hear. It is my voice. And I was blessed with the voice that can soothe you, that can calm you down, that can relax you, and that can make you feel so good about you because it's not about me. So in doing all of these things I have learned, why not share it with you? I'm not selfish one bit. Let me just tell you the things that, and I'm gonna go into my car, uh, uh, how much minutes do we have? I know we're time. How many minutes do we have? I just, I, I'm going somewhere with everything I'm telling you because what I share with you here on my PowerPoint, I'm gonna breeze through it, okay? How much time do we have? share everything is because it's not for me. It's for you. I've learned the non-English speaking community has a harder time. They get treated differently until one of us, the advocate, comes in and speaks for them. And then they'll say, wow, Miss Eve, they treated me so differently because you're in the room. Why is that? I said, it shouldn't be that. It should not be that. So I'd like for you all to learn to become an advocate for a non-English speaking person and for yourself. I have advocated for families that are dealing with IEPs because parents don't know their rights, because school don't want you to know. Just gonna keep it real, people. I was advocating for families in East Chicago and the principal said, next time when you bring in a program, then you can come in. I said what I was doing was teaching your parents your own book, your handbook, your parent, student, teacher, handbook. But they don't want me to do that. Ask yourselves why. It was in Spanish. They don't want you to know. You have a voice. All of you have a voice. You should be advocating for the voiceless, and the voiceless can be the, dis the people that with disabilities. The voiceless are the ones that have the language barrier. The voices are the elderly that don't know what they can say or can't say. They're the ones that get censored the most. Some of them get abused. See, that's where we got to jump in. Many times we say, well, that's not my child, that's not my parents, so it's none of my business. We got to stop that. 
that's becoming a disease. But what we will do is, that's what we'll do. We can't be doing that. As I've been advocating for our youth, it does take a village to raise a youth, right? To raise a child, but it's also taking a village to save one. Stop being spectators. Just keeping it real, people. My show is one of them, of the podcast is called Real Talk with EVE. I say the things that you need to hear, not the things that you want me to tell you, that you want to hear. So advocating for the voiceless. The definition for the voiceless, I'm not sure if you can see it, and I'm just giving you somebody's definition, but I can give you my own and my actions. A person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy is an individual who actively supports and promotes the interest of another person or enterprise. That's what they say, right? Why do I advocate? I gave you some examples of my stories. I seek to ensure that all people in society are able to have their voice heard on issues that are important to them. I do to protect and promote their rights, have their views and wishes considered when decisions are, are being made about their lives, like being in a room of legislators, policymakers, CEOs of hospitals. You better believe I'm talking in that room. That means my community is in that room. That's where they have a voice. To open a pathway for community, especially for the non-English speaking people, we are getting a lot more Spanish speaking families coming in because of the influx that's coming through the border. Guess what? We may not want them here. They may be taking our money, but they're here. Right? They're here. We've got to be able to learn from each other, have some empathy, not sympathy, but empathy for anyone and everyone. One big reason why I do what I do, which you should not, is don't feel like you are all alone. The people I've advocated are exactly feeling that alone. If there's no one there to listen to them, no one there to fight for them, no one there to represent them. I've gone to court to be an advocate for a, lady, a, a mom and her daughter, custody battle. I have a voice, some parents speak English, but don't know how to fight back. And I don't mean fight with, with hands, fight with intelligence, fight with knowledge. Knowledge is powerful, but let's use it, that's even better. Why do you, what do you need to know about being an advocate? Well, first of all, you have to be a good listener. When I talk to the kids, could be your grandkids I've spoken to. Listening is a skill that many often don't, I'm saying double method, often many, don't practice listening. As a parent, we always say, are you hearing me? Well, they hear you, but are they listening? When they hear you, all they hear is wah, 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 right? But when they're listening, they can repeat what you told them. And I've come across a lot of adults where they're not listening. How do I know? Because they're not answering the question. They're telling me something else other than what I'm asking them. And I'll even say it on the radio too, because it happens. Be supportive. Be there not to judge. Be there to support. Just because they have a handicap and you don't, or a disability and you don't, doesn't mean you have to put them down. You gotta give them a hand up. So you gotta be supportive in order for you to be an advocate. And obviously have all the necessary information. I learned so much from someone that's here today. She's an advocate for families that have uh, children with autism. So we've worked together, we've tag teamed for years. And so when I meet a family and I feel that someone has autism or you have a child, guess who I'm gonna call? Especially if they're Spanish speaking, I'm gonna call Elena. Hey, I have a family, this is what's going on. They're not giving them the meeting so that they can talk about their IEP. Oh, guess what? They don't have an interpreter now for their IEP to sit in the room so they can talk to them. So these are the things that I voice. I'm loud and I'm proud because it's for somebody else. And more than anything, be a good representative. Someone that's gonna show up and show up for you and not embarrass you. These are things that you need to do. Listen to the person they are working with or the person that's help, needing the help. Find the issues that you can help them with as in what's the problem. Take notes if you have to. Give the person the information about their options to address their issues. Well, I know about this agency, right? 
Autism of America. I know this other agency, uh, Rahab's daughter. I know this other agency, you know, so this is the information that I give them as options because how I'm involved. So if you're not involved enough, you're not plugged in enough. Help them to present and express their views and wishes to others. You start the conversation and let them finish it. Don't just completely speak for them. Make them feel that they're empowered because they feel like they're voiceless, even if they're speaking English, even if they're Americans. Help them to understand and defend their rights. First of all, as an advocate, you've got to know your rights so you know what you're talking so you, about, so you know what you're teaching them. And let me tell you, all this stopping with the police, we all got rights too, I hope you know that, right? For Spanish, we have this little card that they don't have to talk to the police, they just show them that card. They don't even have to roll the window down. We know that a lot of police brutality has been happening, racial profiling has been happening. I've been involved in all of that. And that's not right. I call it like a train with the police. Instead of going negative and being mean and nasty to them and about them. It's lack of training. I've gotten involved with the Hammond Police Department many years ago with the education and racial profile discriminating and then we talked to the chief and we said, your police officers need more training. Racial profiling is not acceptable. What do I look like? You don't look Mexican. What is a Mexican supposed to look like? We got blonde and blue eyes there. Hello? We have black Mexicans in Mexico. Hello? They start talking to you in Spanish and they don't speak Spanish, English. You don't know that. So we need to all stop looking at the outside and start looking in the inside and advocate for them, especially if they are not familiar with their rights, especially if they're not familiar with the language, with the culture, please be an advocate. But most of all, what I don't see much, because I'm an educator by default, I sit on a school board here in Gary, what I don't see much is a lot of this. I constantly talk to parents, please be here, show up for your child, invest time with your child. They are not just our children, they're your children. You're the first teacher. What are you teaching them? You are their first advocate. Do you even know how to become an advocate for your child? Or do you come in and start hodling, howling, and being hoodlum and all of that? cursing them out, because I've seen it, cursing the teacher out, the principal, or everybody, that's not an advocate, that's just another bully. Just calling it like I see it. This is what we need to do, to become a better communicator, as a parent, as an educator, as a healthcare worker, as anybody. I took care of my two parents in the health department. I was their healthcare uh, taker, and their interpreter, and their advocate, and their everything. So that's how I know, I consider myself an expert. That's how I know, I've been there, done that, and I'm still doing it for others. We gotta be honest, we have to be courageous, we have to have that wit, we have to have industry, we need to know what we're talking about, and eloquence, which I don't see much about. And judgment and fellowship, we gotta be, be able to get along with everybody. Of course you may know who that is, I love to smile by the way. I often wonder, do I smile while I sleep? I hope so. <laughs> The places you can advocate, as I mentioned, were the schools, in the community, not the profits, government agencies, medical care, mental health care, financial assistance, and more. I have advocated in all those areas. And of course, be there for yourself and others, and know the leader in you. We often think we can't advocate because we're weak within ourselves, we're insecure within ourselves. First of all, we don't even know who we are. And of course, I want to thank you for your time. And you can Google me. I've been in the, in the uh, community for 30 plus years. And I say this humbly, that's nothing but God. But you, you can Google me and find everything that I do. I'm not a secret to anybody. I represent Christ first, and I represent my community, and I hope that I keep you all proud as GI people. OK? I really do. Thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. I hope you all have some awesome questions for Ms. Gomez and 
I was writing some things down. Okay. They were speaking a lot of nothing. Okay, thank you. Leaders sit in the front, by the way, and leaders always take notes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that you indicated, which was powerful, pertaining to advocating, you said being in the room. Just being in the room. And for those who can, and serving. Okay, serving as an advocate. We got to serve. For those who may not be able to speak on their behalf, that was powerful. Thank you. Just being in the room. And so I want to know how does advocacy, how does advocacy benefit mental health? Um, Edgewater is a, a, a place where people come for mental health and wellness. So how does advocacy uh, benefit mental health? It a actually is mental health. It actually helps, and for such a time as this, mental health has been prevalent. It's been in the front line, it's been in the page, the front page, because now that we've gone through this COVID season, that has affected a lot of youth, a lot of families. Violence has increased. We're finding out we have problems with our kids. Now it's mental health, social emotional. That is huge. Someone has to speak up for that student. He's a misbehaved child. How do we know? The first thing we want to do as educators is punish them. And then try to figure out later. No, try to figure out now. Meet them where they are. So a teacher can be also an advocate. If they know better, they'll do better. So I always look at kids first to find out where they are here and here and why they're doing this, why they're saying all that they're saying. Some kids haven't slept. Some kids haven't eaten. How do we expect them to behave in the way we want them to? Hey, some adults need that too. Some people that I know personally have been incarcerated and now they have more mental issues than when they first went in there because they're not diagnosing them. They're just a criminal to people. And, and you said something that was awesome because many times we don't know that we can advocate for people that are incarcerated. We're just taking whatever someone else says face value instead of saying, you know what, this is my relative, this is my loved one. No, I'm not happy about what they did, but while they're in there, I'm gonna make sure they're taken care of. How are they caring for them? Are they giving them the medication that they need? Are they getting that physical exam and blood work that they need? They come in with health issues and now you're ignoring that? So now we're dealing with mental health now because they were schizophrenic, bipolar, now we're going with that inside, locked in four walls, a very tight space, and expect them to function the way you think they should function? How about putting them in the hole? Keep watching Vernon T. Bateman's story. I interviewed him, he went in and out of prison. He's out and he's ready to talk even louder and advocate for those that are in there. They've been mistreated, they've been raped, and they've been a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So yes, let's advocate for them as well. Mm -hmm. They're not, I mean, thank goodness, Northwest Indiana, Lake County uh, Jail is bringing back mental health services. Yeah. Thank okay. God that they are, that's right. Because some don't belong in there. They belong in the mental health institute to get treated. Yes. 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 And these are the things that I talk about loud. Because somebody's got to hear it. It's somebody's brother, son, father, child. I've gone to Lake County Juvenile Detention Center and I see those kids. Mental health is prevalent in our youth. To hear a 16-year-old say, Miss Eve, I'm not going to live to be 21. Why do you think they say that? They hand us the guns anyway. I gotta defend myself. I have no one there with me or for me. And you know, all I can do is love on him. Show them how bright he is, how awesome he is. We gotta speak life over our children. They don't have to be mine. They don't have to be mine. I have so many children, they call me Mama Eve because I care for them genuinely. 
But my school boards, you better care genuinely about those students. And that goes back to stop saying it's none of my business. Come on now. We got to stop that. We got to go back to what we used to know growing up as a community. How we were raised. You know, when we, when I was little, I could be down the street doing something. And they'll know. And they'll, my parents would know before I came home. And they said, That's okay, it. well, everyone back in the day knows me as Tony. Okay, Tony. Did you do? <laughs> exactly. But we're so afraid of saying anything. Well, you're only afraid because you allow that fear in you. That's what we allow. When we stop allowing all that stuff to come in us, we become who we're supposed to be. That advocate, that parent that's supposed to care about somebody else's child. I bet you they would want me to help their child yeah. if I say something. Then they're going to come and tell me, well, why didn't you? Well, you haven't been that kind of parent. You just told me it's none of your business. They're not your child. But it, you make it your business when it happens to your child, then you come to me and expect me to do what you're not wanting to do. So that's what we got to speak out. I'm not saying being mean and disrespectful. It's touch their heart. Talk to their heart. And that's all a part of mind, body, and spirit. Hello? I speak. I, 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 I am led by the Holy Spirit. And I know that if my spirit is healthy, everything else falls into place. Everything else falls into place. I speak healing over me. I speak life over me. How many, you know what? Can we do something real quick? Ten seconds of your time. And repeat after me. I am. I am. Wonderful. Wonderful. I am. I am. Amazing. Amazing. I am. I am. Powerful. Powerful. I am. I am. Beautiful. Beautiful. I am. I am. Somebody. Somebody. I do. I do. Mean something. Mean something. And today. And today. I am. I am. All that in a bag of chips. All that in a bag of chips. Let's give her another hand. We have time for one or two questions. One or two questions. Yes, if you would like to stand, I will come back there with the microphone. So they're all on the social media platforms. You can find them. If you find me, you'll find everything else. 
And anything you need, you just reach out to me. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful, wonderful nugget. And I'm sure we have all learned something about advocating for the voiceless. So I want to take this time to thank everyone for coming out. I want to thank our social media platform for joining us on today's discussion, advocating for the voiceless. And again, thank you, Miss Eve Gomez, for that powerful presentation. Don't forget, every third Thursday of each month, we're going to be right here at Edgewater Health. Um, giving more information about mind, body, and spirit. And if you want to know more information about Edgewater, our services, and the many free programs that we have, I invite you to go to our website at edgewaterhealth.org. I'm Latonya Woodson. Please reach out to me, L. Woodson at edgewaterhealth.org. And remember, Edgewater Health, what do we do? We take care of the whole person. Thank you.